Good evening. Um, thanks for coming. I'm Dr. Hansen. I'm the Medical Director and Chief Quality Officer for Emory Specialty Associates Primary Care. And this is Primary Care Best Practice Lecture Series. We're pleased to have Dr. Sanchetti speaking to us tonight about um, recommendations on CP lung cancer screening. Dr. Sanchetti trained at University of Alabama and did his surgical residency St. Luke's in New York, and then his fellowship at um, Emory in um, thoracic surgery. So um, we also want to give you a heads up. We're real excited that these, going forward, these lecture series we promised would be archived. We now have them on YouTube, and we'll be sending out um, later this week a link so that you can go on at your leisure at home and then actually complete the um, the viewing of it and do your own CMB um, certification. So, without further ado, Dr. Sanchez, thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Hansen. Thanks for having me today to talk about CP lung cancer screening. And uh, please uh, interrupt either in the audience or on the internet to uh, put that in question. I said I'm a thoracic surgeon primarily here at St. Joseph's, um, which is uh, the site that sort of uh, began the whole um, CT lung cancer screening process here at uh, Emory, at least uh, from a very um, refined standpoint. So, um, sort of go over all that as part of my talk. All right, so we all know that lung cancer is a leading cause of cancer death. Um, there's over 200,000 cases in 2014, but it doesn't really change. Um, about 150,000 deaths per year. And despite all of modern medicine, um, there's still a 17% five-year survival with lung cancer, uh, which is one of the worst uh, in, in cancer these days. With cigarette smoking still causing greater than 80%, People are still smoking quite a bit. As you can see, in men and women, it's uh, over a quarter of all lung or all cancer deaths, um, and oftentimes it's quoted as many of the big four combined. Uh, so if you combine uh, breast, prostate, colon, uh, in terms of numbers, lung cancer tends to still be more. Um, so it's one of those that may not get as much press, but it's definitely something that we all see in Uh, this is the incidence here, um, more men than women. Uh, recently, we've been trying, starting to see more actually in women, um, especially in the sort of 50 to 70 uh, year age non-smokers, um, uh, primarily. Uh, we're not really sure where that comes from, but I think it's secondhand smoke when they're younger. Up to about 30% of non-smoke, or sorry, 30% of cancer can sometimes be related to in non -smoke. Mortality rate, as you can see, is very high uh, for cancer in 2017, and still a fifth of people in this country still smoke. Um, so what's the point of screening? If I said that the survival is terrible and you know it's mostly due to smoking, why screen? So this is really the reason that the survival is is bad, and uh, and why we should screen. So still, uh, lung cancer is discovered these days uh, with about over 50% of it in the stage. Four. So metastatic disease with a you know, single digit, if not just the teens, survival. Um, and then you can add another 22% with regional uh, metastatic disease. So a large, large majority of patients present with distant disease. Partly because lung cancer really doesn't have any symptoms until it's really started to spread. A small lung nodule lung cancer is not that cause any symptoms until it starts causing on the pleura or invades into the bronchus or whatever the case may be to start having coughing or vomiting. And this is the important point about all that is that there's a huge difference between a stage one or stage B, uh, stage one uh, A or stage one B lung cancer, which is a small localized cancer, um, versus a stage three or four lung cancer in terms of survival. So you know. Finding it early can increase the patient's survival greater than 60%. So you're changing a 20 to 30, 40% five-year survival to upwards of 70, 80, 90% uh, five-year survival. 
and, and that's all based on early detection. So lung cancer screening has sort of been in the, in the research realm since the 70s. Um, in 1970, uh, NCI sponsored three studies that uh, primarily looked at chest x-rays at the time um, with the mix of sputum cytology and had two arms uh, essentially looking at if, if detection and survival was improved. Um, I'll summarize this quickly, but they had a pretty big study and they screened people for six years. Um, and essentially they, they showed that the incidence, um, the resectability uh, were greater in the screen group. Um, essentially they found more lung cancer than they found them more early where they were able to have surgery. Um, but there was no real significant reduction in lung cancer mortality for chest x-ray. Um, so some of the screening talks sort of disappeared after uh, this for some time. And then CT scans started to get a little bit more involved. And um, as we all know, you can see a lot more on CT scan than you can see on the chest x-ray. So the LCAP or IOCAP um, study is a, is a big study, um, international perspective, multi-institutional, over 20-some, you know, 30,000 patients that looked at uh, CT scan primarily for screening and lung cancer. And um, essentially, a little bit over 500 patients had a biopsy. And if you look at sort of the long-term results, um, in the first screen, they found about 405 lung cancer. And then with the subsequent screens, say if they found a nodule that just needed to be followed, they found more lung cancers. <clears throat> so the important part, um, or two, uh, one, there was a greater than threefold detection, higher detection rate with CT scan as opposed to chest x-ray if you compare this study to somewhat historical controls. And more importantly, that 85% of those lung cancers that were discovered were discovered in stage one. They're resectable with a And this is sort of what points to that survival can be better if you get a stage one. So these, this is sort of what happened somewhat in the early 2000s up to about now. A lot of stuff happened, and we'll go over some of it, but the most important thing really is the NLST study, um, which is the National Lung Cancer Screening, uh, Lung Screening Trial. So that's a prospective randomized trial that compared low-dose CT screening to chest X-ray screening, and the endpoint, um, the primary endpoint of all of this was lung cancer specific mortality, primarily in high risk patients. So the um, eligibility is, is related only to high risk patients, 55 to 74, um, asymptomatic current or former smokers with pretty decent smoking history. Um, they can't have quit more than 15 years prior to this study and then no other kind of cancers, lung cancer or otherwise. So this study had a, had a large accrual, um, and it actually was um, it was stopped midway in accrual because of the finding that they started to find. Essentially, they found there was a 20% relative reduction in lung cancer mortality with uh, low dose CT scan, and a 6.7% reduction in all cause mortality. Um, obviously, that indicates that the low dose CT scan is important. Significantly improved patient survival. And if you somewhat, you know, compare this to mammography and PSA and, and our colonoscopy and all those screening tests that we have, um, none of which really provide the same risk reduction or relative reduction in mortality that those do. Importantly, 40% of them were found in stage one, a little bit less than the LCAP trial, but nonetheless still quite a few much better than the 18 to 12% I said earlier. And then the number needed to screen to prevent one death was 320, and if you compare that to mammography and colonoscopy, it's less. So it's a pretty good screening test. Um, in terms of the population, if you extrapolate this out, um, if you, in, in order to estimate uh, how many people it would save, um, you would avert about 12,000 lung cancer deaths each year. Um, most of them men, as I told you, the incidence is higher in men. And that would be about 8% of all the American lung cancer deaths. If you screen the entire population and really get all the people that need screening, need screening. 
obviously I know that's difficult to happen, but that's on my something to shoot for. Cost effectiveness is always an important topic when it comes to screening. Um, and I won't go into all this economic data, but essentially um, the important parts is that the cost per person is, is, is pretty minimal in terms of um, However, if you look at it, the cost per life year saved is about 19000 Compare that to some of the other screening tests like mammography and colonoscopy, it's about in the range of what of those would be as well, $15,000 to $29,000 for those tests. Um, otherwise, you know, the incremental cost effective ratios, um, $52,000 for life year gain, not really as important as the, as the cost per life year saved, which is really the thing and more importantly than that, you know, um, the downstream, downstream revenue from everything that a CT of the chest can provide. And I know all of us have had CTs or had patients with CT of the chest and, and we end up finding something that we weren't looking for. But it ends up, you know, you get downstream revenue, you also get, you know, uh, improvement in, in their medical care when you find certain things that you're not looking for that end up having follow up imaging procedures. Or and that's where that 6.7% all-cause mortality improvement does. The next question you're going to get about the CT lung cancer screening or low-dose CT screening is radiation exposure. How can I get a CT every year? Am I, is it going to cause me to have lung cancer if I don't already have it? So a regular standard chest CT is about 7. Um, I actually don't know what the MSD stands for. Um, a low-dose CT is about 1.4 in the moderate. Um, so if you just extrapolate it out, if you do screening, it would prevent lung cancer 20 times more than it would cause. So the, the chance of you getting a lung cancer from your CT scan is minuscule at most. The next topic is a secondary net analysis from the NLST, and essentially looked at the smoking cessation uh, counseling during the screening. Um, and Essentially, it took 26,000 of the non-smokers who had quit within uh, less than 15 years, and it found out that there's a 20% reduction in death after seven years of not smoking and the screening. And for every additional year that you add to that, you decrease about 9%. Um, and then if you take your current smokers and sort of extrapolate that out as well, um, for each additional 10-pack year that these screened patients add to their tobacco history, it increases their lung cancer mortality by 10% and their all-cause by 6%. So you know, these are important facts that you can bring to your patients when you talk to them about screening, but more than that, talk to them about smoking cessation. So from all this data, um, we have a few guidelines now. So the U.S. Preventive um, Service Tax Task Force essentially recommended annual screening uh, with a low-dose CT individuals high risk for lung cancer based on age and smoking history and the grade B recommendation. Um, so essentially they do recommend the service with a moderate uh, benefit. Uh, oddly enough, to counter in, uh, counteract that, the American Academy of Family Physicians said there's insufficient evidence to recommend it. And um, they they essentially stated in their in their study that, that a shared decision-making discussion is really the most important thing. They're essentially telling the patient that they can't, there's insufficient data to say that there is a benefit and that there's potential harm from the CT itself for screening or finding other incidental things and having procedures that end up having comorbidity from that. Most importantly that we all know is the CMS um, did determine that the evidence is sufficient to uh, add lung cancer screening um, to, uh, to be recommended along with the shared decision making. So once again, it's important that the patients understand what they're about to go through in terms of the benefits and the risk of having a CT scan. This is our Emory Healthcare lung screening criteria. Um, group one are the guidelines that we, that are the CMS guidelines. These are the patients that are insurance eligible and meet criteria if they call in for a long screening or if you get 
further along the screen. Um, so 55 to 77 in most of our patients, asymptomatic uh, smoking history equivalent to 30 pack years, current or former. And if they have stopped, they uh, can have stopped more than 15 years since. And then uh, shared decision making is required. Shared decision making and physics. In terms of the self-pay patients, so if the patient calls in and wants their own CT, own screen, um, it's $150 in our system. Um, and these are sort of the patients that that meet that criteria. You know, most patients can call in to get one if they would like, but you know, we have a good system in terms of um, you know, recommending some patients that may meet the criteria but don't meet the criteria. So this is one of those handouts that I was saying that I can we can send to y'all, but this is essentially something that you can have in your in your office with you um, that that uh, looks at the lung cancer screening requirements on the right there, essentially the ones we use here at Emory, and then has a little checklist in terms of the things that you have to document or talk about in your shared decision making visits. So you can figure out the pack years, you have to go over your symptoms, um, talk about the benefits, talk about the risks. And then, you know, um, other considerations are the comorbidities that I mentioned from other things being found in CT that could lead to various tests and such. And, um, and then uh, counseling in regards to keeping up with the screen. The benefit's only helpful if you follow the screening guidelines. Um, if you just get one screen and you have a nodule and they never see you again, then that's not going to be really that. So along with the shared decision making visit um, documentation, along with the order of the CT scan, um, um, it says things at the bottom there in terms of what needs to be in your documentation and the criteria for the CT screen. And, and I'll have all this information at the end in terms of the contact number, but it's pretty easy to remember. It's 404-686-66 long. And that's how you get a screen. So I know you guys can't read this, um, but it was very difficult to scan in. So uh, essentially, this is our workflow. And this is essentially what your patients are going to go through. And I'll talk through the sort of little nuances of it, but you go through it pretty quickly. And essentially, you have two columns here. One is the referring doctor calling in 686 and or putting an order in. PCMD and then the pathway to get scheduled our um, uh, lung screen coordinator uh, Lucien she will get the order and she will start the process making sure that everything is in the right order to get the screen done. If the patient calls in themselves um, then they'll go through a similar process but they do go through health connections and, and, and answer some questions and make sure they fit criteria um, and then if they fit criteria they will be required to either go to their primary care doctor for their shared decision making or they can meet one of our um, APPs in the pulmonary department and do their shared decision making for them. Then we go to the appointment, pretty standard, they come in and get a CT scan. Nothing really too special about that. CT scan goes to the radiologist um, and it goes a few ways. Uh, the read itself, it'll go to you guys. Um, and then it'll go into our lung view system, which our lung view system is some of our tracking system for this uh, CT lung screening program. Um, the, our coordinator has full control of that. She will review all the findings and she'll determine what needs to be done. If no further follow up is needed, the report has gone to you guys and it'll go into lung view to stay forever, but essentially the patient doesn't need any follow up or things of this kind. Um, depends on what kind of patient if they need um, further follow up and I'll, I'll go through that as well. If they do have a finding that is non-incidental or incidental, um, you guys will be called, the ordering physician will be called, and it will be determined at that point which pathway to go through. Um, the coordinator will get in touch with you in terms of a few things. First of all, if it's an incidental finding, does a, a referral need to be made and that's up to you know, whoever the ordering physician is and who to refer to and how to refer us, et cetera. Um, if it's a lung finding, um, we have a few options for that. Same thing, if, um, if it's a 
all the way up to the ordering physician in terms of where and, and if and when to refer. These are just recommendations from the program. And then we also have a long novel clinic that I'll discuss in just a second. That's a place to send these patients as well to help them get uh, managed from that standpoint. And once again, anything that comes through the system goes into a long view system. I know that was a question, and it always is in the database. So what are the things that we see on the CT scan? We're going to see ground glass opacities. We're going to see mixed lesions, which are sort of ground glass and solid together. And then we're going to see solid. And then from that, what do we do? So there are lots and lots of guidelines in terms of long nodules, solitary pulmonary nodule management process. There's, this is the ACC, sorry, this is the NCCN, Long Cancer Screening Guidelines. As you can see, a lot of different pathways to go. There's the Fleischner criteria, which a lot of the radiologists refuse. Um, same thing, a lot of different ways to go. There's also the ACCP guidelines, which are a little bit different than this, and a lot of different ways to go. So that made it a little bit confusing. So what essentially what's now been come out is called the long graph assessment, which is primarily for uh, long CT screening, similar to uh, breast mammography as a RAD system as well. And it's similar in that they have uh, very uh, fixed criteria or categories based on what the findings are, and from that, um, management going forward. And that's what you're really going to get on your report or your CT screen. You'll get an, a regular chest CT read, but at the bottom it may say, you know, long rad 2, recommend screening again in 12 months, um, that kind of thing. And that makes it really easy to remember and to know what to do with these. I just mentioned the lung nodule clinic, so we have, in part of developing the CT lung screening initiative here, we developed this lung nodule clinic. And essentially, it's it's a clinic in the pulmonary department, uh, primarily run by the consult attending for that time period. Um, and the target is having screened patients that meet criteria to be seen, if the primary care doctor uh, or the ordering physician chooses to, within 24 to 48 hours of their screening. Patients aren't going to be sitting there knowing that they got a lung nodule and they just have to sit around and wait and nervous what this is all about. Uh, we do have a tumor board here at St. Joe's that uh, can review the lung nodules as well. These are on the left is our, our little table that dictates our criteria for where our patients go. And as you see, we, we base it off the lung rat criteria. And then most of them, um, two through four B, um, are recommended for a lung nodule clinic visit um, along with their action in terms of calling the referring provider and doing a CT scan. But here in the asterisk is all, only a suggestion and it's really up to the referring provider where if that patient needs to go somewhere. So real quickly I'm just going to talk a little bit about diagnosis and treatment. But essentially, you know, we find a nodule that we think needs to be diagnosed and, and I think we all know about all these various options. But CT guided needle biopsy is an option, bronchoscopy and transbronchial biopsy is an option, endobronchial ultrasound biopsy, navigational bronchoscopy, and then finally surgical biopsy um, with immediate anatomic dissection if it is a malignancy. And this is um, a video just to make it not as boring. Um, essentially, this is a patient with a three or four millimeter nodule, and I'm just the reason I brought this up is I'm going to fast forward through it, but this is a technique that we have to find these nodules. And essentially, we have the radiologists, because we can't find the nodules in our minimally invasive platform, so we have them put this little gold BB right next to the nodule in the IR. Um, and then we essentially just take out the gold BB that we can see in the fluoroscopy. Um, and I'm going to just fast forward through a lot of this to skip it, but essentially, that's a good way, you know, to identify a smaller lung nodule if the patient has concerns or if the patient has a malignancy history and you're worried about metastasis or, or something of that sort. Let's get to the end here. So you can see, um, when you cut it open, you can see sort of that gold little marker that helps us find the nodule, which is sitting in the matrix there. And that ended up being a uh, metastasis from a cervical cancer. And it just measured about four centimeters. That's right, four millimeters. 
And in terms of treatment, um, you know, we all know that Winship Cancer Institute is here. It's an NCI designated comprehensive cancer center here at all sites for all the hospitals. We have a tumor board here and all the and all the hospitals. There's lots of options for lung cancer patients. The surgical resection is the gold standard, whether it's robotically or thoracoscopically. But we do have now, uh, sorry, stereotactic radiotherapy for the non-operative patients with good results. Radio frequency ablation, interventional pulmonary techniques, chemotherapy, and you know, clinical trials with immunotherapy, which has a, has a great future ahead of it. All of these things are available for your patients in terms of treatment for their cancer, should we find one. And we should, uh, and in terms of what we have here, um, this is what we've had since November 2016 till now, since we started the initiative here at St. Joe's. Um, so we've found, we've screened 200 people. We've had, um, you know, 52%, the large majority of them are, you know, um, lung rats too, so they're probably just getting another scan next year. Um, very, uh, the next biggest percentage are lung rats one, so they may not need a scan, but most likely getting another one based on the criteria of smoking history. And we have had some um, significant findings as well. Um, we've had two patients, um, that have had biopsies for nodules, um, for concerning nodules, um, one of which I will present right now. Um, so this is a 60-year-old gentleman. Uh, he had a 40-pack year history. He quit about three years ago. His, uh, his wife was in the medical field um, and, uh, and uh, you know, found out about low-dose CT screening, had his, her husband you know, get one, and found this 1.5 by 1.7 seven centimeter um, adenocarcinoma in the left upper lobe. Um, I did a robotic left upper lobe on him. We discharged him in home for two days and that's a stage one A non small lung cancer. So this is exactly what we are hoping for uh, in terms of finding these patients that have a huge smoking history and, and you know, have a very, very high likelihood that at some point in their life lifetime they're gonna have a lung cancer. If we can find them early like this gentleman get it taken care of by whatever means necessary, so we're going to provide them a you know, 70 to 90 percent survival versus a 30, 20, 30, 40 percent survival if we found it much later. Important slide really, this is, so for the lung screening, uh, 404686 lung is the number to use. Uh, Lucienne McKinney, she is really the go-to person for all of this. She's the reason we're able to have this program, and she's our coordinator, um, and that's her number there. Um, she didn't put her email, but um, she's in our new system, so she should be pretty easy to find. She's always available for follow-up and emails in terms of questions for these patients, and she's really had a good hold in terms of what happens to the patients, where they are, what's the right next step for them. So, you know, if you have a screen ordered for a patient, you don't have to worry about them getting lost or worrying about missing something. Let me see if I understand the frequency. If if somebody just stops smoking and they decide to do the screening, they're kind of committed to yearly screening for 15 years. If they stop smoking 10 years ago and start the screening five years, mm -hmm. so it's basically you're looking at that 15 year. Right, and that's the current recommendation because we don't have huge long term follow up from that uh, ST at this point. I mean, I think at some point. Uh, we're going to have a criteria of stopping uh, based on all the studies that are right now, but currently that's a recommendation. I've noticed that we're, we're, we've probably ordered one of these at Wellstar just because we're in tournament and they have almost like they do a calcium score. Mm -hmm. You all do that as well, and they, but they use a different scoring system than the traditional calcium yeah, the, our, for if it's a low dose lung screening CT as orders as such, I don't, I haven't seen uh, our radiologists put anything about calcium mm -hmm. score. They may put right. coronary atherosclerosis. Sometimes we'll know, right, atherosclerotic disease, but the ones coming back from Wellstar specifically score it. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if that's just something. Yeah, that I mean they've had a program for a long time. Mm -hmm. um,
seems like it makes it a two for test. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I yeah. mean, if you've been smoking that long, you probably have some degree of it. Right. Yeah. That's kind of just generating a lot of cardiology referrals. Yeah. I could bring that up to our radiologist. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they would have to. I'll see if I can find one scan. and maybe even send it to you because it's a different scoring system. Yeah. If not, I had to look it up because I didn't know how to interpret what they were finding. They were writing on there and there was no interpretation scale as to how it correlates with traditional patient scoring. Oh, yeah, I can find out. I don't know if they have to do anything different with your scan, but I'm sure they do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's it. All right. Thank you, guys.